In today's video, we'll talk about a series of murders that could have been committed by a serial killer, the disturbing unsolved murder of a small town police officer, and an infamous murder case from England. But before we get to that, we want to talk about our sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is an excellent streaming service that specializes in documentaries. It was created by filmmakers, and they have amassed thousands of documentary movies, series, and playlists. So it's a great way to learn more and get insight into topics you're already passionate about. Magellan TV is ad-free, and many of the videos are available in 4K. Magellan TV has a lot of great documentaries, but one I specifically enjoyed was Psychopath, Redefining Rational. It takes a look at the role of psychopaths in society, and it talks about how little we actually know about psychopaths. I also really enjoyed the docudrama, The Great Mint Swindle. It's about robbery of a mint in Australia, and the strange events that followed. And of course, Magellan TV has more than crime and mystery documentaries. They have other great documentaries in genres like science and tech, mind and body, and war and military. Magellan TV is also incredibly easy to access. It's available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS, or simply cast from your phone to your TV. If you want to check out Magellan TV for yourself, go to MagellanTV.com slash criminally listed and you'll get a month for free, so you have nothing to lose. So please check out Magellan TV because you'll get access to thousands of great documentaries and you'll be supporting criminally listed. Number 3. Gerald Mork Iola is a village in central Wisconsin. In 1995, the village had a population of about a thousand people. The village was so small that the police department only had two full-time officers. One of the officers was 31-year-old Gerald Mork. Gerald was a pillar of the community. His father, William Mork, was the sheriff of the county. Besides being one of the two full-time police officers, Gerald was also an EMT and the village's fire chief. Gerald was a member of several clubs, including the JCs, and he was an active member of his church. He was married, and he had two young children. Every July, Iola hosts a car show in Swap Meet. On average, about 85,000 people visit the area for the event. So in mid-July 1985, all of Iola's police officers, including part-time officers, and the county sheriff's deputies were working overtime. It was Gerald's eighth month on the job. On July 13th, Gerald started his shift at 6 p.m. The end of his shift was 6.30 the next morning. Shortly before 5 a.m., a sergeant with the sheriff's office noticed that Gerald wasn't responding to radio calls. So he drove around the village looking for him. At about 5.20 a.m., he drove by the village's cemetery. In one of the cemetery's driveways, he saw some headlights. He turned into the driveway and he saw that the car was an Iola Police Department squad car. He pulled up to the squad car and he saw that there was a body lying face down beside the car. He got out of the car and went to the body. He quickly figured out it was 31 year old Gerald Mork and he was dead. The husband and father of two had been shot twice in the back of the head. Gerald's service weapon was still in his holster and the snap was closed. His car was still running. The sergeant alerted the sheriff's department and the state crime lab was called in. Together they conducted the investigation into the murder. Gerald's father, William, who was the sheriff of the county, 
was not involved in the investigation. Investigators found two spent shell casings under Gerald's body. They were both 380 caliber. Then three days later, the crime lab dug into the dirt where Gerald had been lying. They found a 380 caliber round. A forensic expert thought that the bullets were manufactured in the 1960s or earlier. Also, the gun that was used to kill Gerald was rather unusual. It was most likely an Italian Beretta model 1934. Not long after it was made public that Gerald Mork was killed, a man got in contact with the Sheriff's Department. He said that at about 4 a.m. on the morning that Gerald was killed, he was sitting on a bench on Main Street in Iola. He saw an Iola squad car drive down the road, then turn onto the highway that goes to the cemetery. A few minutes later, another Iola squad car drove down Main Street and then turned down the same highway that heads towards the cemetery. The man said that at about 4.30 a.m. he heard a couple of loud bangs that he thought sounded like firecrackers. Then several minutes later, one of the squad cars drove back down Main Street. The man saw the driver of the car and he said it was 38-year-old Michael Schertz who was Iola's chief of police. Gerald and Schertz were Iola's only full-time officers. Then the Sheriff's Department learned something from a 65-year-old resident of Iola. Three years earlier, Schertz had confiscated two guns from him and both were loaded with the ammunition from the 1960s. One of the guns was a Breda model 1934 which he brought home from World War II. The Sheriff's Department was able to get a search warrant for the Iola Police Department in Schertz's home. It turned out that the two guns that Schertz confiscated were missing. Investigators asked Schertz where they were. Schertz told one investigator that he had sold them. The investigator wanted to verify his story, so he asked who he sold them to. Schertz said that he did not know the guy. He said he was just some stranger in a bar. Schertz told another investigator a completely different story about the missing guns. He claimed that he dismantled them and threw out the parts. The day after the search warrants were executed, 11 days after the murder, Police Chief Michael Schertz was charged with misconduct in the office and theft of firearms. On August 25th, nearly a month after the first charges were laid, he was charged with first degree murder. Schertz went to trial for first degree murder in December 1985. News of a small town police chief accused of killing another officer in cold blood, execution style, while they were both on duty was big news in the area. So the trial was held in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which is about 130 miles from Iola. At the trial, a part-time police officer testified. The officer said that when the village was hiring a full-time officer in late 1984, Schertz had recommended a man for the job. But the village board voted to hire Gerald Mork instead. The officer also testified that after Gerald was hired, Schertz tried to get him fired several times but he was unsuccessful. The officer also said that Schertz had told him that if Gerald were ever found murdered, he would not have to put much effort into the investigation. And finally, the officer claimed that Schertz said if he couldn't get Gerald fired, he would slit his throat. Other people testified that they had heard Schertz predict that Gerald would be shot because he wasn't a competent police officer. 
Scherz's lawyer pointed out that there was no physical evidence, like fingerprints, tying Scherz to the crime. He also pointed out that there were no witnesses to the murder, and the murder weapon was never found. Several security guards who were working on the grounds of the car show testified that they talked to Schertz at about 4 a.m. and then he left the grounds. Then several members of Schertz's family testified that he was home at 4.10 a.m. Then another security guard said they talked to Schertz at 4.30 a.m. on the grounds of the car show. Schertz's lawyer said that these witnesses gave Schertz an alibi for the time of the murder. The trial lasted for two weeks. The jury deliberated for just over four hours. They found Schertz not guilty. Schertz eventually went to trial for the theft of firearms and misconduct in the office. Once again, he was acquitted. Schertz was dismissed from his job as police chief and he sued the county twice. Both times he lost his lawsuit. Michael Schertz died in November 2002 at the age of 56. The Iola Police Department said the investigation into Gerald Mark's murder is currently inactive. Number 2. Teresa Hollander On the night of February 16, 1914, 19-year-old Teresa Hollander attended a lodge meeting in Aurora, Illinois. At the time, Aurora had a population of around 10,000 people. Teresa arrived at the hall for the meeting at around 7.30 and her father, Louis, was already there. Teresa told her father that she had talked to her former fiancé, Anthony Petras, on the streetcar on the way there. Petras was taking the streetcar to night school. Teresa had broken off the relationship because her father did not want them to get married. Six months earlier, Anthony married another woman named Amida. Teresa was engaged to be married to a man named Nicholas Felton. Teresa and Nicholas Felton were scheduled to get married on March 5th, which was to be Teresa's 20th birthday. Teresa supposedly told her father that Anthony confessed to her that he regretted getting married. Anthony also supposedly told her not to marry Nicholas Felton. Lewis ended up leaving the meeting before his daughter. Teresa left at about 9.15 p.m. and minutes later she boarded the streetcar. On the streetcar was Anthony Petras. Teresa sat in the seat across the aisle from him. At about 9.30, Teresa got off the streetcar near St. Nicholas Cemetery. She lived with her parents and their house was two blocks from the cemetery. When she wasn't home by 10 o'clock, her mother began to worry. But her father thought she just stopped off at Nickelodeon, which was an early type of movie theater. By 11 o'clock, Teresa still wasn't home and her mother was in a panic. Wearing only her night clothes, she ran out of the house and into the snowy night. She didn't even put on any footwear. As she made her way to the streetcar stop, she saw some footprints in the snow leading into the cemetery. She followed the footprints and she found her daughter's dead body in some blood splattered snow. The police were called and Teresa's body was examined. She had been beaten to death with a wooden club. The club was found near her body. Some of her finger bones and other bones in her hand were broken from putting up her hands in self-defense. The police talked to Petra's parents 
and they immediately accuse Anthony Petras of killing her. Teresa's mother said that Teresa was afraid of Anthony. He had apparently threatened to blow up her house if she ever got married to someone else. Teresa's father also told the police about an incident that happened near the cemetery a month earlier. Someone had strung a wire at ankle level across the road. It looked like the wire was set up to trip someone. It did not trip Teresa because she was with Nicholas Felton at the time and he saw the wire before they got to it. Anthony Petras was arrested the morning after the murder. In the light of the day, thanks to the tracks in the snow, the police were able to piece together what happened. They thought that the killer tripped when he stepped into a ditch just outside the cemetery and he fell to his hands and knees. He was most likely chasing after Teresa when he fell. He got to his feet and grabbed Teresa a few feet from where he fell. The police knew this because Teresa's muff was found a couple feet from where the killer fell. The killer then carried Teresa into the cemetery where he beat her to death with a wooden club. Teresa had not been sexually assaulted. Also, Teresa's gold watch was found near her body so the police do not think that robbery was the motive for the murder. The most obvious suspect was the man who they already had in custody, Anthony Petras. When the police checked his coat the morning after the murder, they found blood stains on it. After Anthony was arrested, a man who went to night school with him talked to the police. He said he saw Anthony when he left school on the night of the murder. Anthony left in time to catch an earlier streetcar, but he let the streetcar go past him. Anthony got on the next streetcar, which was the streetcar that Teresa eventually boarded. Another man came to the police station and he said he was on the same streetcar as Anthony and Teresa. He said he got off at the same stop as Anthony, which was the stop after Teresa's stop. The man said that after they got off the streetcar, Anthony ran back in the direction of where Teresa got off. The police asked Anthony about a streetcar trip home after attending night school. He admitted that he sat across from Teresa. He claimed they just exchanged hellos, and that was it. But two witnesses who were on the streetcar said that they talked during the entire trip. Throughout the day after the murder, the police examined the crime scene more closely. They found a pocket knife which had a name inscribed on it. The name was Frank Daremont and Aurora, Illinois was inscribed below it. The pocket knife was found close to the area where the killer fell down. The police concluded that the killer dropped it or it fell out of his pocket when he tripped. So the police tracked down Frank Daremont. He was living in Chicago, Illinois. He had a concrete alibi for the night of the murder, but he did admit that the knife was his. He said he had lost it three years earlier. Daremont gave the police his work history, and it turned out that when he lost his knife, he was working in Aurora, and one of his co-workers was Anthony Petras. Anthony claimed he had never seen the knife before. His wife, Amida, was interviewed by the police and she also said she had never seen the knife before. Amida also said that on the night of the murder, Anthony got home at about 9.40 p.m. and he was at home for the rest of the night. She did not notice anything unusual about him. 
Teresa was buried in the same cemetery where she was killed. Her grave was about 50 feet from the site of the murderer. Mourners at her graveside could still see the bloody snow. Anthony Petras went to trial about five months after the murder in July 1914. His lawyer pointed out that no one saw him with Teresa near the cemetery and he had an alibi. His wife Amida said he was home at the time of the murder. Anthony testified and he said he wasn't strong enough to subdue Teresa, carry her into the cemetery, and then beat her to death. The trial ended in a hung jury. Eleven of the jurors voted to acquit. Anthony went to trial again in October 1914. This time, he was acquitted of murder. At around 9 p.m. on November 18, 1914, just over a month after the trial, and about nine months after Teresa was murdered, a young man was walking home from the YMCA in Aurora. He was less than two miles from St. Nicholas Cemetery. As he was walking beside the Free Methodist Church, he heard some moaning. He looked in the churchyard, and he found an unconscious woman. The man got some help, and the woman was rushed to the hospital. The doctors quickly determined that the woman's skull had been crushed. She had been struck in the forehead with a blunt object. She had not been sexually assaulted. The police went to the churchyard, and they found a pipe wrench a few feet from where the woman was found. A small purse was also found in the churchyard, and it was empty. Well, the woman still had all her rings on her fingers. So the police did not think that the motive of the attack was robbery. The next morning, the victim was identified as 55-year-old Jenny Miller. Miller was the daughter of the former mayor of Aurora. She was thought to be the richest woman in town. Even though she was rich and her purse was empty, the police still did not think that robbery was the motive. Miller's house staff said she did not keep much of value in the purse. The doctors operated on Miller, but she never regained consciousness. She died about 48 hours after she was attacked. A witness said they saw a young man hanging around the church around the time Miller was attacked. He was described as tall and he was wearing a light overcoat and a gray hat. Many people in Aurora thought that the murders of Teresa Hollander and Jenny Miller might be connected. The police were open to the idea but they pursued other theories as well. Several people were arrested for Miller's murder but no one went to trial. About four months after Jenny Miller was killed, on February 25, 1915, two women in Aurora were walking home from the movies. They were a couple of miles away from the church where Miller was attacked. They found a young woman lying unconscious on the side of the road. She was rushed to the hospital, but she died along the way. She was later identified as 22-year-old Emma Peterson. It was clear she had been beaten in the head. Not far from where she was found, a lengthy gas pipe was found, as well as an old wool glove. The police determined that the pipe was the murder weapon. The police thought that Peterson was struck once in the forehead while she was standing, and then she was hit another time as she laid on the ground. Also, not far from the body, the police found her purse, which was empty, except for two photographs of people Peterson knew. A woman said that around the time Peterson was attacked, 
she saw a man in the same area. She said he was tall and he was wearing a gray overcoat and a black hat. Once again, several arrests were made, but no one was charged. All three murders were committed in just over a year of each other, and all three women were killed within a radius of several miles. They were all walking alone at night when they were attacked. Also, they were all beaten to death with a blunt object, and the killer left the murder weapon at the crime scene or dropped it nearby. To give the people of Aurora a sense of what type of killer they were dealing with, the police compared him to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The police said that most of the time, the killer was a respectable man who could blend in with everyday society like Dr. Jekyll. But when he had the opportunity, he acted like a murderous madman like Mr. Hyde. The newspapers called him the caveman murderer and Jack the Clubber. The police thought that there would be more murders, but there wasn't. If there was one killer, after he beat Emma Peterson to death, he stopped killing, he was arrested for another crime and was jailed, he moved to a different city, or he died. Over 60 men were arrested in connection with the murders, but only Anthony Petras went to trial. Today, the murders are largely forgotten. Since the cases have been cold for over a hundred years, we will most likely never find out the identity of the caveman murderer. Number 1. Wendy Sewell In September 1973, Wendy Sewell was 32 years old. She lived in Milton by Yulgrave, Derbyshire, England with her husband. She worked as a typist in the nearby town of Bakewell. On the morning of September 12, 1973, Sewell went to work. At lunch, she told her co-workers she wanted to get some fresh air, so she was going out for a walk. At about 12.50, several people saw her enter the Bakewell Cemetery. About 25 minutes later, 17-year-old cemetery caretaker Stephen Downing came across Sewell, who was partially dressed and lying on a path in the cemetery. She was unconscious and she was bleeding from the head. Stephen kneeled down beside her and tried to help her, but he couldn't. He found some people and they alerted the police. When the police arrived, they didn't summon an ambulance right away. Instead, Sewell managed to get to her feet, but she was very unsteady. She fell and smacked her head hard on a tombstone. She was then taken to the hospital. The police concluded that she had been struck eight times on the head with the handle of a pickaxe. The handle was found close to her body. The doctors determined that she probably had been sexually assaulted. After Sewell was taken to the hospital, Stephen was brought into the police station for questioning. He was the prime suspect because he found the body and he had blood on his clothes. Stephen was 17 years old and he had learning disabilities, so his reading level was that of an 11 year old. He was questioned for nine hours straight without a lawyer or even one of his parents being present. Stephen's father, Ray, came to the police station and asked to see his son, but he was turned away. At the end of the interrogation, the police said that Stephen had confessed to attacking Sewell. He had also signed the confession. Not long afterward, Stephen recanted the confession and claimed he was innocent. He said that at lunchtime, he left the cemetery 
who went to feed two hedgehogs he was nursing. While he was at home, he talked to his mother. She confirmed this part of his alibi. Stephen said when he got back to the cemetery, he found Sewell lying on the path. He said he kneeled down beside her and tried to help her. When he couldn't do anything for her, he found other people in the cemetery and they called the police. Sewell never regained consciousness. She died two days after she was attacked. When she died, Stephen was charged with murder. He went to trial six months later. The only evidence against him was his clothes, which had a little bit of blood on them, and his confession. The jury deliberated for less than an hour, and they found him guilty. He was sentenced to a minimum of 17 years of prison. This made him eligible for release in 1990. To be released, Stephen needed to show remorse for his crime and take responsibility for his actions. But Stephen refused to admit they killed Wendy Sewell, so he continued to sit in prison. Four years after his earliest release date, he was still incarcerated. So in March 1994, Stephen's parents, Ray and Juanita, got in contact with Don Hale who was the editor of the newspaper, The Matlock Mercury. They asked him to look at Stephen's case. Ray and Juanita were sure that many people in Bakewell knew who really killed Sewell, and they knew it wasn't their son. Ray and Juanita were sure that the police department had framed their son. Hill started to look into the case, and he saw some glaring problems. The more he dug into the case, the more he felt that Stephen Downing was innocent. One of the major things he learned was that Sewell was carrying on several extramarital affairs with men in the town of Bakewell. Some of these men were prominent businessmen. She was also supposedly blackmailing some of the men. This would have given someone motive to kill her. A motive was something that Stephen's case was lacking. Stephen had never shown any signs of violent tendencies. So why would Stephen beat to death a stranger in broad daylight at his workplace? Hale also found several witnesses and their accounts show that Stephen could not have committed the murder. For example, two witnesses said that they saw a young man running from the cemetery shortly before Sewell was found. Another witness said she saw two men standing beside a van acting oddly outside the cemetery. She wrote down the license plate of the van on the back of a pack of cigarettes. After she heard about the murder, she went to the police station to tell them about the men and the van and the police told her they did not want to hear about what she saw. Amazingly, for over two decades, the woman kept the empty pack of cigarettes with the license plate number written on it, and she showed it to Hale. Hale had the license plate checked out, and the van belonged to a man whom Sewell was planning on meeting that day. As Hale investigated the case, he published articles about his findings. A woman read one of the articles and contacted Hale. She said she was in the cemetery around the time of the murder. She saw Stephen leave the cemetery and then a few minutes later she saw Sewell live in the cemetery. Sewell and a man were embracing each other. The witness knew the man because he was a prominent businessman in town. A few minutes after she saw Sewell, she heard a woman scream, but she assumed it was just someone playing around. 
This casts major doubt on Stephen's guilt. The police said that Stephen attacked Sewell before he went home to feed his hedgehogs. But the witness said she saw Sewell alive and in the company of another man when Stephen left the cemetery. Also, Stephen would probably not have had enough time to go home, talk to his mother, feed his hedgehogs, and then get back to the cemetery, sexually assault Sewell, find the murder weapon, and then hit her eight times in the head. In addition to these witnesses, Hale found several more that either proved that Stephen couldn't have committed the murder, or they placed serious doubt on the police's case. A few of the witnesses had gone to the police to tell them what they saw. But the police did not want to hear what they had to say and they were all told to go away. Hill also examined the evidence against Stephen. There was blood on his clothes but there was only a little bit and there were no smears. Had he been the killer there would have been more blood on him specifically his gloves. Or if he wasn't wearing the gloves during the attack, then his fingerprints should have been on the handle of the pickaxe. But there were no fingerprints on the pickaxe handle. The other evidence against him was the confession. The confession contained several statements that was contradicted by evidence found at the crime scene. It was also clear that Stephen did not say many things that were written down in the confession. For example, there were words in the confession that Stephen did not know the meaning of. As Hale was investigating the case, he got threatening phone calls telling him he should stop looking into the case. He said that on two different occasions, a car tried to run him down. He also claimed that another time while he was driving, a large truck tried to run him off the road. But Hale continued to investigate the case and he campaigned for Stephen to be released from prison. Also, a petition was started to get Stephen released from prison. 3,400 people from the Bakewell area signed it. In early 2001, an appeal was filed requesting that Stephen's conviction be overturned. In February 2001, the judge decided to release Stephen from prison. He had spent 27 years in prison. That was 10 years longer than the minimum because he had refused to confess to the murderer. In January 2002, Stephen's conviction for murder was overturned. Stephen Downing's imprisonment is considered the longest running miscarriage of justice in the history of the British legal system. For his reporting on the case, John Hale was awarded the Order of the British Empire. He also published a book about the case called Town Without Pity and it was a bestseller. The question is, if Stephen Downing didn't kill Wendy Sewell, then who did? Don Hill believes he knows, but he's never publicly identified the man. Hill said that he is a prominent businessman at Bakewell, and he probably worked with two associates who helped him with a cover-up. Hill also believes that Wendy Sewell's murder may be connected to two other homicides that happened three years before Sewell was killed. On March 8, 1970, 18-year-old Jackie Ansel Lamb was seen in North London hitchhiking. She was heading north to Manchester, which was 200 miles away. Six days later, her body was found face down in a field just outside of Manchester. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Her body was found about 44 miles from Bakewell. Seven months later, on October 12, 1970, 24-year-old Barbara Mayo 
was hitchhiking in North London. She was heading north to Catterick, which is north of Leeds. Her body was found six days later in some woods near the village of Glapwell. Glapwell is about 20 miles from Bakewell. Like Ansel Lamb, Mayo had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. It is commonly believed that one killer is responsible for the murders of Jackie Ansel Lamb and Barbara Mayo. They were both young, attractive women who were last seen in North London hitchhiking north alone. They were both sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Also, their bodies were both found face down in an isolated area. Don Hale thinks that their murders are connected to Wendy Sewell's murder for several reasons. The first is that Sewell and Mayo looked a lot alike. Also, Ansel Lamb and Mayo's bodies were found relatively close to Bakewell. In fact, five men from Bakewell were interviewed regarding Barbara Mayo's murder. One of those five men was an associate of Wendy Sewell. Hill believes that Sewell was killed by a prominent businessman at Bakewell and two of his associates helped him cover it up. One of those associates was another one of the five men from Bakewell who was interviewed about Barbara Mayo's murder. The police have Barbara Mayo's killer's DNA, but no match to it has been found. Unfortunately, unless an arrest is made in any of the cases, we may not know if any of them are connected and we may never know who killed the three women. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Please go check out criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about exclusive podcasts. Also, please check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash criminallylisted. But that's it for today. Thanks again for watching.